Okay, so I'm back with my dear friend, Blue Benedum, who is, you know, we've been friends for many, many moons now. And Blue is, uh, and if you've ever watched any of the YouTube channels that we, or uh, any of the YouTube uh, presentations I've created, you've seen Blue with me on many different occasions. He's an amazing runner. I don't know if he's semi-retired now or you kind of like, you know, <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, in the <laughs> retirement phase. <laughs> well, I mean, come on. It's like it's it's a lot of running, right? Yeah, let's – yeah, that, that many – I think I started, first started working with you in 2010. And my last race actually with you, training with you, was 2021. Yeah. So that's a good span. And I've dabbled since then. So, yeah. but, yeah. So the conversation uh, today is going to revolve around transitioning. And I'm not talking about sexual transitions. I'm talking about <laughs> I'm talking about those who finally are drinking the Kool-Aid. Somebody got in their head and explained to them the whys and hows to move away from landing on their heel when they run to landing on their forefoot. And what I preach to people is being the correct way to run. Now, <clears throat> the problem is you're familiar, being a coach yourself and dealing with this as, as much as I have is that um, this transition from landing on your heel to landing on your forefoot comes at a cost initially. And this cost is represented in <laughs> soreness in the posterior chain, usually the calf, the Achilles, some plantar fasciitis issues, things like this. And it's discouraging, you know, when people, they feel like they really are onto something and they feel like it makes sense to them and they make this attempt to make this correction, and then ultimately it ends up, in their opinion, it ends up badly for them. Yeah, and what do you say? The, the, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't? Yeah, that's so right. People would rather, better, they'd rather the have the same you know injury because, right. yeah, because they, they know what the, uh, you know, the, the shin splints feel like. But then you add an Achilles tendonitis, and they're like, wait a minute, that's new. Yeah, yeah. I don't want that. Yeah, well, and that, you know, and it's, it's so that, that is the fear. So, like, if, let's just say, for example, and, we, you know, you and I have done this before where we stood in front of a group of people and I'd say something like, um, what is your volume limit per week running? You know, raise your hand if you get 20 miles a week, right? And then you see a few hands go up and then 30 miles, 40 miles. Everybody seemed to know what their break point was in their weekly volume. <laughs> where they needed to back off because injuries start to, res you know, show themselves. And uh, so on that thread, it's like, what if you could eliminate all that? What if you could just like open up Pandora's box and get to a place where your running is so precise uh, and your body does what it's designed to do, you, you're seem seemingly in, uh, you know, free of an, any injuries, right? You just can do this all day long, every week, whatever. And I have, and I'm sure you have, transitioned people from being these, you know, 15 to 20 mile a week runners into, you know, over 50, 60. In some cases, I've had people go up to 100 miles of running in a week and seemingly pain free. You know, they get sore. I mean, obviously, you're going to get sore, but it's like global yeah. fatigue. It's not like, oh my God, my calves are so lit up, I could barely walk type thing. Yeah. And so yeah. anyway, I thought it would be good to talk about why this happens and what we could do in order to mitigate this problem so that you get to the promised land. Yeah, and give tools, you know, just a protocol for how to get there. And I think that's what every form analysis I've ever done. It's like, you know, you want you want it all right now. And I think I I actually, I was definitely that way when I first worked with you. It was like, oh, okay, I get it. Like, I heard what you said. Let me just go do all of it right now. And I think having a specific protocol where you don't do that, where you actually like treat it more like intervals, you know, and you, you approach it, you break it up a little bit in your approach. Um, yeah, you're going to get there way quicker, which is sort of counterintuitive because you think like, oh, let me just do this massive overhaul. And then from now on, just do as much running as I can with this new form kind of makes sense at first glance, but then when you start to do it, the overload is just happening everywhere from Achilles to calf to like, 
you name it, you're just you're you're running on like stiff freaking like you're like a peg leg runner because everything's like just not it's all so tight. I think you know the the eccentric loading patterns. Like think about the Achilles being under load the entire stance phase compared to just like the last part of it when you're in an eel strike. I mean, just that right there is you know evidence of needing to take it a little bit slower. So well, not only that, but what I find, and yeah, I'm sure you've seen this as well, is that the guys that are seasoned runners. And, you know, they're looking for a way to become better at what they're doing. And so let's just say that the guy is tripping along at about a 50-mile-a-week thing. He might even have a goal. He's running a marathon very soon. So on his schedule leading into um, this transition, he's got planned for tomorrow he's going to do a 10-mile hill repeat or some stupid thing like that, right? And then so he decides, okay, well, I'm taking this new methodology I just learned and I'm going to go get my 10 miles in, whatever it might have been, yep. or track workout for that matter. And then now you got all that intensity and, and the volume that, that compound into this problem, and then you get hurt, okay? So now mm. forget about just being sore. Now you're hurt. And then, yeah. um, then you can't run for a while. Then you're really you know, disenchanted with the whole process, and you might miss a couple of weeks of training that you didn't want to miss, and you're pissed off and I've been through all this. I've been through all this with people. And uh, now I, I, when I transition someone, and I do, I do, there's not a person that comes in to see me that I don't try to convince that they need to get off their heels and get onto their forefoot. Yeah. And I don't care who they are, how old they are, how capable they are, how fast they used to be. If they have corruptions in the way they're moving, I'm going to show them that there's a better way to do it. But I always preface it with prepare for the soreness, prepare for the problems, and then do some things to st stay on top of that so that you can continue to train uh, and not revert back to what you were doing. And so here's, you know, not, not to kick a dead horse, but just here's what I found to be very common. So you're out there and you're nailing it. And I do this with people. Like I... You know, and I, I don't know, back in the day when we were doing this stuff together, um, I didn't do this, but I'll share with you. I, I have this thing I call uh, trust but verify. Uh, we talked about this, I think, briefly. Mm -hmm. So I do a VO2, let's do, I do a gait analysis, put them on the treadmill, show them how to run the way they're supposed to run, show them that they're actually capable of doing it. They're, the video is showing them a live, you know, recount of the way they're moving now compared to what it was like 20 minutes ago. It looks real good to them, looks real good to me. <laughs> then we do a VO2 test. And so we get the data from the VO2, and then I want to take them out and run them in the real world. So I get on my little chase bike, and I, I have this contraption so I can collect all the data from them, like their heart rate, their cadence, things like this. I actually put my little speaker in my little water bottle cage. So I have this audible metronome going off to get their frequency on point. And I'll run them for a few miles. And I'm, I'm looking at the deal points. I'm looking at what their heart rate's doing compared to what we saw in the test. And try to keep them on point. And generally, I can keep them running very, very nicely for that little bit. But later th that day, they'll start to, oh, my God, man, you're right. My, my cat's so good. <laughs> and then I start breaking out the tools to try to correct some of these problems. And so uh, we're going to visit that if you don't mind. Yeah. Uh, and I prepared this. By the way, um, there was, I'm going to have to put my old man glasses on for a second. I can't see what I'm doing. There, yeah, was, put mine on. <laughs> this, yeah, there was, an, uh, <laughs> there was a, a, a video that I watched that was pretty entertaining because, you know, I, as you probably are aware, I study anatomy uh, often. No, you don't study. So um, <laughs> check this out. So this guy was doing a really great job of explaining where things are in the foot and ankle, right? Mm, yeah. So he, he takes this lady's foot, and I'm just, I am just took a snapshot image from it mid midway. And, you know, if the guy gets a, an attitude because I snapped part of his deal, I'm just going to right up front just tell him I apologize right now. But <laughs> so what you're looking at is the black tracing is the bones, Right. And then if you look towards the heel, you could see that the calcaneus is called out there. And then in front of that is the talus. 
and just mm-hmm. above that, uh, you're starting get it, to get into the uh, the tibia and the fibula, which is on either side of the leg, and just below the talus, which is the bone ahead of the calcaneus, which is like the ankle bone if you're looking at it, there is the navicular bone. And I talk about this a lot because uh, when you land poorly, this system collapses. And you can see in red, he's calling out the muscle, but then he's also calling out the tendons and the, um, it's a posterior tibial tendon and he's not really associating the nerve yet. He does that later. But it's all like residing right b- beneath that navicular. So the idea being, um, when um, we get to get rid of this, when when your foot fails you, when you land, then all this other stuff starts to happen. And yeah. so you're gonna love this. By the way, I've never shown this to you. I've only done this once on YouTube, and it's almost like it's scary. It's like it's like scary. But you're going to learn, right? You ready? Ready. So this is my life. Your real foot. foot. <laughs> look, dude, look that at looks this very like closely. Scary real. Um, I mean, like, wait, well, let me get it out here. That's so, scary. Wait, 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 wait. So you could see, like, the veins in wow. all this. Yeah, I'm telling you. Um, so look at this thing. Bro. Wow. The future's here. I mean... Wow. Everything, every bit about this is so, you know, I 24 seven, I'm thinking about this work. Right. And one day I'm just like in the house kind of milling around. I said, you know what? I wonder if I can find a lifelike rubber foot. Right. Yeah. <laughs> because, you know, I have, I have models that come apart and all the bones and all the you know, all the tendons and what are all, all the muscles and the ligaments and bones, whatever. It's all called out so you can learn what these things are, you know. But it doesn't really speak to people, right? This yeah. speaks to people. When you look at this, then you can pretty much understand where we're going with all this. So That's scary. If, if you recall the guy, the image I just showed you a moment ago, is that we were like looking at um, this part of the foot, which is basically right about here, right? So mm. when, when someone heel strikes, they land heel first. All this system that's designed to help mitigate impact forces from the landing reside or initiate, initially reside in the front of the foot. So you actually need these toes to flex, which is going to put tension on the plantar fascia which is going to end up supporting the midfoot, which is going to end up preparing the foot. Um, everything kind of locks down to uh, to try to take on that energy and deliver it up through the kinetic chain, right? And so yep. this is my argument for bypassing, but let's just say that you have the, the little um, American pink feet that never see the light of day by the way, where you live, where you live, you know, you live in uh, flip flops. You know, you're you're primarily barefoot throughout the course of the day. Yeah, at, at the beach, whatever. You, you know, your feet see the light of day. Now, I live out here in in Middle Tennessee now, right? It's um, I want to be careful how I say this because I don't want to offend anybody, but the the Midwestern folk they spend a lot of time in the winter. So they're used yeah. to having their feet like trapped and encapsulated and they don't ever seem to really get a chance to naturally articulate like the feet are designed to do. So their feet get weak, right? And so when your feet are weak, then asking your feet to do something as profound as just initiating all this 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 uh, resistance to impact it gets it gets to be a, a bunch. It gets to be a lot, right? So um, you need to strengthen your feet. I mean, at the end of the day, yeah. and I think about this often. It's like I see people that don't really, you know, they're they're worrying about their squat, they're worrying about their deadlift, they're worrying about all these big, you know, prime mover exercises. They're trying to get really strong, and the whole time that they're in the gym, they're they're wearing gym shoes, and they're, you know, they're not really they're not starting from the ground up. 
right? Yeah. And so um, the first thing I would want to point out is that obviously enough, you want to make sure that on a regular basis, you're doing something to engage your feet. And I'm talking about just basic stuff like doing calf raises and, you know, working on the lower quadrant and doing things for your tibialis. Nobody ever does anything for the, the front of their lower leg. You know, they never do that. And so yep. they develop imbalances, the calf muscles taken up. So the, 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 the front of your leg, the tibialis, is responsible for deceleration, okay, you coming to earth. And the calf muscles and all that is responsible for acceleration. So when the accelerators are taking the responsibility for the decelerators, you have overload and imbalance and you have, you, you know, you end up, end up having problems. So yeah. what, what I do with people when they're in trouble is I start with this. Let me see if I can find it. And I know we've probably visited this and it's like kicking dick, a dead horse, but that's how I roll. So, um, I start with this, okay? And here I am flossing from the foot all the way up onto the calf. Uh, and what this is going to do is, like, I know, appreciate that this is somebody that's already uh, in distress, right? So inflammation's residing in there. It's causing a bunch of problems. So this flossing technique helps to flush the all the... Um, the inflammation and all the the jazz out of just trying to make it easy, jazz out of the lower quadrant as you mobilize and help the fascia free up and what have you. You take it off and then mobilize again and boom, you're 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 feeling better. This is a treatment, and um, and I have this conversation with my clients online often. Um, and the other uh, option that I go through the, a lot is cupping. And you can see in this picture, we're using these latex cups. And I'm starting, look where I'm starting, right beneath that navicular. Yep. Uh, on the, right on the plantar fascia, right where that posterior te tibial tendon. I'm actually chasing the posterior tibial tendon right up onto the leg, which you don't see, but I'm all the way up onto the calf here. And then we mobilize and then we take it off and boom. And uh, it results in basically instant relief. Um, and it's interesting to me when I meet people and we discuss these things. Maybe they've, a lot of people I meet these days have uh, already taken on this transition on their own. Mm. You know, maybe their buddy sold them on the idea and yeah. it's so important to do it. And they do it wrong. And then they're, then they're jacked up. And then they come see me because they're jacked up. They said, well, that didn't work. Now I got to pay somebody to help me. <laughs> it's like, it's like you're the, you know, when you have some trouble with your plumbing or electrical, whatever, and you try to fix it yourself and you just totally screw everything up and you got to call somebody. Yeah. Kind of the same grill. And you can get away with a lot. I mean, I feel like the, you know, the more able you are, I think like when I was first meeting you, I was the prime age to be able to deal with all kinds of overload. So I could just, I could screw it up and I could get away with it and not get really injured. You know, I would get, I don't know if you remember, but you were taping my Achilles like three layers because I had the oh, yeah. tendinopathy, yeah. you know? <laughs> yeah. But still it was like, I mean, and that was a legit like, you know, overuse injury. But still, for the most part, I, I could I could really overload and just, I was so out of whack and on so many levels because I was taking different pieces of it and then just overdoing different parts of it. Um, but if I did that now, there's no way. I mean, it's like I was I was lucky to be able to deal with that kind of massive overload. And I think depending on the athlete you're talking about, they can deal with a lot more or less, the whole spectrum of, you know, how much can they deal with it. The older you get, the less, the more particular you have to be about how you did that transition, right? right? You can't just like, like I did, like throw yourself at it and just hope that it works out. Um, and I mean, I, I think also when I came into it, if you think back to like the Newton running era and like it born to run coming out, it was such a, like, it was so brand new in concept, even though it was like, you know, ages old, like how we were born to run, you know, and the whole, um, Lieberman study had just come out. So like people were jumping on it. Um, but I think and me being young as an athlete as well, I was just like hungry to just do it all at once. Um, so just an interesting era, but you know, I think I, like I was lucky to have met you cause you had all of the information. And I think that's what ultimately led me to being able to sort of, I would consider master it for my own level of it. Um, but yeah, nowadays I think it's, there's a lot of information out there. There's a lot, there's just a lot of noise, right? 
So I think understanding what you need to do to your point of a lot of people are already working on it. Like that's the first step, but then understanding what are the protocols, like, how do you actually do it? And I think what I find now and why people still seek me out, it's like, I get what I'm supposed to do, but it's just not like, it's not happening. Like I, my brain says, I want to look like that. And then I'm supposed to try to do what, you know? And I think when I first met you, that's what got my attention was I had pr probably six months before having met you, I was reading running mechanics books. And I was like watching, I remember watching the female Boston Marathon winner and saying like, oh, I can recognize in her movement patterns that she's like, her stride is behind her. And so I was like, I'm gonna start doing that. And then when I met you, I was like, this is perfect. Cause I'm gonna show this guy, like I, I already get this shit. And I, I was so surprised to see the video and be like, wait up, I've been working on this for six months. Where, why is my stride in front of me? It doesn't, and then I remember I told you like, turn up the yeah. treadmill. And the whole thing was, it's just that I thought that I, you know, was doing something different. So I think, that just goes back to through the transition, through like learning how to do it. I think it's it's that process is just unclear even now with all the information out there. So well, yeah. So you're absolutely right. And and one of the one of the epiphanies that I've had probably in the last five years was, you know, it was one thing to have uh, evidence, right? So doing a video analysis where I shoot video from three different planes of motion, put it up on a big screen slow it down to about an eighth speed and show people very precisely, yes, in fact, you are landing on your heel. Yes, in fact, you are overstriding, yeah. right? And they're like, oh, shit, I, I, had, I had no idea. I, you know, <laughs> I, I've been reading this book and my friend told me, that would, you know, so they got the, all this bad information and then they, they were living the dream. They thought they were getting it done right. And in fact, they weren't anywhere near where they should have been. So, what I what I found to be a very powerful bit of information is being able to alter people's perceptions. So one of the things I did that was really a cool tool is I'd set up an iPad on a stand in front of the treadmill so that, and then the camera to the side, so the camera is picking up the side view of you running while you're running forward. So you're running forward and looking at yourself from the side, right? So you could, wow. see, in, you could see in real time if in fact you're doing what it is that you know that you're supposed to be doing. So mm -hmm. it isn't a function of like there's a secret. Nobody knows what the secret is. Everybody knows yeah. what they're supposed to be doing. Nobody seems to figure out how to do it correctly. And it's generally because they're, one, they're operating on a false assumption. They feel like they're doing it right, where in fact they're absolutely screwing the pooch, right? And even worse is that like when the, the injury doesn't seem to go away, it's like, it was sore, now it's really sore. Now I took a couple days off, I tried to go back, and it was even more sore. And the fact of the matter is, they think they're doing the right thing, and then they're pissed because they think, it doesn't work, man, I keep hurting myself. And in fact, they're doing <laughs> something completely wrong, right? Yeah. One of the things that I see often, and you've probably seen this as, as well, is that just the angle of approach, right? So they're coming in, they're, they call it toe diving. So yeah. they're still overstriding, but they're coming in sharp like this. And mm. I don't know it to be true, but what I believe to be one of the reasons why is that people want to see that, in fact, they are landing on their forefoot. Mm. So they show themselves right. their foot by overstriding. So that, that reach that they're creating and that insurance that they're on their forefoot puts them in a very precarious angle. And so now the distance traveled from the forefoot to the heel actually setting down is putting more stress on the heel court. Mm. So it's making it worse, right? So, or they could do something else, which is it hurts. So they start to migrate back towards their heel. And yeah. they think, oh, I got it finally. It doesn't hurt anymore. It doesn't hurt anymore because they're right back where they were before. You know, yeah. uh, inefficient, but less, less problem. So, um, and you know, this is my day to day. I wrestle with this every stinking day, right? Whether it be virtually or people come to see me or whatever. And yeah, getting them to finally realize what it is that they're missing and showing them what it is that they're missing and then helping them find that realization is it's a big deal. It's it 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 takes it takes some you're not gonna read it in a book. I mean, I, I just got through writing yeah. a book again. And I have a, a, there's a bunch of information in there on running, right? And I'm going to explain to you what needs to have happen. 
And then I'm going to explain to you why it didn't work when you try to do it. And I'm going to try to get in there and create as much content as possible to help people better understand what it is they're trying to achieve and why, and sell it hard as to why they need to do it. And I think I've, yeah. impressed, I've impressed in the book a few different times that whatever it takes to get there, it's worth it. Hmm. It's worth it. Yeah. You've been watching the yeah. Olympics? Like, oh, it's hands down m most exciting Olympics in history for the Americans. I mean, track and field. I, I was watching gymnastics, canoeing, rock climbing. Um, but track and field has just been crazy. Did you watch the 15 meter? <laughs> oh, yeah. 1500 meters. 50 meters. Insane. Yeah. Dude, it doesn't get better than that. I mean, oh, Hawker's finish. I mean, it's just, yeah, wow. What, a, what an amazing. Well, but so, so you know what's really interesting, too? And uh, I want to be careful how I do this, knowing who I'm talking with. But I, I, I tell people, I said, look, have you been watching the Olympics? I want you to re-watch these guys running. Instead of worrying about who's in front, who's behind, whatever, look at the way they're moving. Mm. They're yeah. losing ground behind them. They're not reaching out and grabbing the ground in front of them. <laughs> yeah. Right? All of them are doing that. Some people yeah. want to get persnickety about what part of the foot they're landing on. I said, but you know what? You turn it into a push instead of a pull, you're on the right path. Yeah. Yeah. If you look at their lower limb, from the knee to the contact with the ground, it's on a vertical plane. Yeah. Their knee is flexed. Their, yeah. their lower limb is not outreached, right? Yeah. It's simple things like that. So, because you get push people. People want to push back on process. You know, there's always an argument one way or the other. I said, well, geez, I don't know. Watch all these runners, all of them, all, all <laughs> of them. They're all, yeah. these are elite runners. They're all kind of running the same way, right? Yeah. You know, and if you can yeah, aspire, I, yeah. Yeah. If you can aspire to create that, you're on the right path. Well, and I, I, I get pushed back all the time. I, I coach a um, uh, Tower 26 is an uh, like elite advanced triathlon group in LA. Jerry Rodriguez founded it. He's an Olympic swimmer. Uh, amazing program, amazing coaches. Jim Lubensky heads up a big part of it, and he's an amazing runner himself. Um, but what I see with the triathletes is this, like, what we would call marathon shuffle hips, right? Like that really, like, it's like small hip angle. And I work with them on the track once a week, a big group, 20 people. And, and it varies. Different people cycle through, cycle out. And I see them at all different, you know, I've been doing it over, for over a year now, and I see all different phases of their training, getting into Ironman, shorter distance, Olympic distance, all this different stuff. But the commonality is the range of motion and the lack of flexion in the hip. And what I try to always emphasize is the sequencing of what's happening in the lower body. And to your point about the Olympics, watch it in action. It's, it's not just, it's like what you're talking about in the ankle. The ankle, the knee, and the hip are going from as extreme of flexion as you can create into as extreme of extension as you can create in the right sequence. So if you were to extend the, the knee into full extension in the wrong moment, then you've therefore created an overstride, regardless of what everything else is doing, right? So it's like the, you know, I think it's like what I'm always trying to emphasize is like, we are looking for full hip extent or hip uh, flexion first. You can't like having full extension is great, but without the flexion, there's no power there, you know? And then it's like having extension in the knee, especially on landing, that's where we're getting overload and, you know, the knee joint. So anyway, I just think it's interesting to think about it's, this is that triple extension, those three joints working in sequence to achieve, you know, the capturing power and then delivering the power at the right moment in time. And the cool thing about the Olympics is like every single step of every one of the athletes is just firing at the perfect moment right so yeah it's cool to watch did you see that the this nico young uh made it to the olympics yeah i've been watching him and his his brothers because they're from uh they from southern Park. california down yeah yeah so yeah i've been watching them for a long time and oh, amazing i mean to be his age and he's just a phenom yeah i mean i feel like like the next two three olympics is gonna be amazing to watch what he what he can do so the the, the talk is that his brother's better than him yeah, well, and which one? I mean, there's, yeah, there's, there's, but there's two. There's two more coming down. Yeah, there's two. There's three of them in total, and they're all, they're all fast. So you know, I yeah. made the comment a couple times, and I think it's in my book too. Is that if you want to 
you want to make it to the Olympics, you got to pick your parents, right? Yeah, absolutely. That's great proof. I, I saw something that Des Linden was saying before the Olympics, and they were asking her prediction on the 1500. And I thought it was phenomenal because she predicted that Kerr and Ingerbrigtsen would be like so focusing on each other that potentially you could have an American come out of nowhere and, and surprise everyone. Exactly. <laughs> it's exactly what happened. <laughs> yeah. 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 It's good stuff. But I mean, um, at the end of the day, people listening to this are seeing this, um, they're just regular folk, right? Commonly. Yeah. I mean, there's a yeah. couple outliers that are good athletes, great athletes looking for an edge and they'll, you know, they seek it out, you know? Um, yep. And then it gets real finite. You know, the closer you get to the top of the pile, the more detail uh, you need to bring into play because you're eking out seconds, you know, fractions of seconds in some cases. And yep. it's a big, big difference where uh, there's a thing I call the phenomenon of initial values, right? What you began with has much to do with how much you'll gain, right? So if you're in really bad shape and you're just a terrible runner, you're going to start noticing you're dropping four and five minutes off your mile time, <laughs> right? You know, yeah. you become an elite runner. If you can pull off another second, it's happy days, right? You're, you're just killing yep. it. Um, but speaking to those people, it's like they might look at it and say, well, that's not for me. Look, at they're, they're Olympians at whatever, you know, why yeah. would I want to aspire to that? Because I, I just want to be able to get a 5K or I want to get a 10K without hurting myself, right? You know, first thing people want to worry about. And I hear this a lot, by the way, is people will tell me they want to be able to run long into their life because it's yes. their method of keeping their fitness, right? Mm. It's what keeps them strong, keeps them vital. And their fear is that if they keep hurting themselves, that they won't be able to do that. that yeah. you know, the, the scare tactics that you get from these orthopedic guys that say, oh, that knee's, you know, you better get on that elliptical now. You, that, that knee's not going to take it. <laughs> You know, or your hips are bad, or whatever. They they talk you out of trying to run because yeah. they never say, well, you know what? Maybe you should find somebody that can help you run better, so that you can put longevity into your running. And then, but but that never seems to that never seems to come to be uh, the conversation. You know, that's the value in this you know podcast like this and keeping this conversation going, even if it's repetitive is that there's still so much of that out there where the doctors are saying, I oh, just don't run. Oh, how are your knees? And it's like, we're still having that conversation rather than we have so many examples of how to run. I mean, even just talking about the Olympics, think of like an average elite runner, how many miles they do in their lifetime and how few of them are complaining about knee problems. You know, it's like, is that not enough science right there <laughs> so, to stop the conversation with the doctor saying, don't run if you want to save your knees. It's like, no, run better save your knees and have the health, have your cake and eat it too. So yeah. I think that's a, a huge, um, that's, a, that's a primary reason why we need to keep, you know, podcasts like this well, going. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, you know, it's funny too, because uh, I've had this conversation. I was out, I was hoping to see you and I didn't get a chance to, but when I went out to visit Hunter, uh, you know, and really at the end of the day, I went from Tennessee to Malibu with one purpose in mind to move his lower limb in 15 degrees. I said, if I can bring your foot underneath your knee a little closer than it is right now, I'm going to probably save you about 15 seconds per kilometer mm. in your high rocks competition. And that's going to cause you ultimately just running alone should give you another two minute drop off the world record. And I still believe it to be true. Now, he went, he went ahead and screwed it up by overtraining and dieting, you know, right into his event, which was just a travesty for him, unfortunately. But when I left, he was running really, really well. Mm. It's, it's like, at the end of the day, most people, uh, as you suggested, you can, why don't they get it yet? You know, why are they not understanding? Yeah. yeah. There, there is. There's, there's, you said it yourself. There's a lot of noise. We get a lot of noise out there. And it's difficult to sort through it. Um, and people will typically do what their buddies are doing. You know? Yeah. I've seen, I know you've seen this where you see three or four people running together and they always run together and they look like each other when they're running. Yes. They, they mirror <laughs> each other's movement patterns. Yeah. So if someone's Absolutely. got this thing going like this and they all got this thing going. They're all doing it. <laughs> Whatever it is they're doing, they do it together, right? And it's. So like when, if, if you start running with somebody that really screws it up, 
you're soon to screw it up with them, right? Yeah. So, I don't know. But not to get too far away from the point at hand, the idea being, A, probably the best thing to do is have somebody that knows what they're doing get together with you and help you to understand what you're doing wrong. Yeah. And now we talked about noise. you got to be careful. You want to make sure that whomever yeah. you speak with has got a clue. That he's, you know, he yeah. definitely knows what he's talking about. And you could generally figure that out in a few minutes if you're paying attention. Yeah. Um, and then don't just trust your perception in, initially. You know, I have people video themselves running. Once they know what they're trying to do, once they've been able to do it correctly, then they have confidence that it's actually achievable. Video yourself often to ensure that you're on the right path, you're doing it correctly, right? Yeah. And then the self-help stuff. I mean, we talked about the floss and we talked about cupping. Uh, you can get out, you know, and, and do some scraping. You can, you know, um, some people are all about the foam roller. I don't, I'm not that keen on a foam roller. Uh, I just don't yeah. like that it's just, so here, so just <laughs> your body parts. So here's, here's where you're at, right? So the foam roller is just like right here. Well, yeah. I, well, I don't have a leg, so I was hoping to show you a leg. But with with flossing, it's three dimensional. So we're, yeah. we're we're taking everything, all the material, all the way up in 360 degrees, and we're influencing it at the same time because our ligaments, tendons, and things like that—they're not isolated. They're 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 interlocking. They're working with each other. And so yeah. doing something like that works really really well. Um, the cupping is just regionally available to reduce inflammation. I find it works really, really well, especially for people that have calf stuff, calf distress. Scary how, how much better people feel like almost immediately from doing it. Um, but I don't know. I think. Uh, yeah, um, I, would, I would add to I would add one thing to the like this, the the process of the transition and the the pa the patterns that you're 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 manipulating, you're changing your movement patterns, all these things. I, I think I would take a turn from your run flow concepts, sort of unrelated, but but related in that you know the idea of a spectrum. And if you think about like you know your slowest running to your fastest running, that's a spectrum of of intensity, but also a spectrum of dynamic ranges of motion. And so you know you, I think the tendency is to like when we look at the Olympians, you're seeing them at their max output. And it's like, oh, that's how they run. Yeah, it's how they run when they're at their max output, you know? And it's like, and they do that quite often. They're very good at that, you know? It's they do a, a large amount of that, especially leading up to the race. But, you know, there's the whole spectrum within that. And it's like, you watch these guys warming up, you watch their, you know, their mobility exercises, you watch their strength training, you watch their, uh, I mean, like everything from a dynamic warm up and, and activations and stretches or 45 minutes of them doing drills, you know, that type of stuff and getting plyometric and getting the A skip and how crazy their A skips get. And, you know, all of the things that they, that these athletes do to get there, that being said, even within their running, there's a huge range of slow to fast and like what those hip flexion, hip extension, knee flexion, knee extension and ankle. I think the ankle is like the one that we just don't, I'm glad you had the foot because it's like the ankle, it just gets the least amount of attention in, the, in this conversation where it should probably have some of the most. And I think, I think it, to me, it's the expert level. So it's like, you can get the hip extension and flexion part, get the knee, you can land below yourself. But like, how many people have you worked with where, including myself back in the day, where it's like, cannot stop the plantar flexion landing, you know, the pointed like toe landing. It's like, if you can get the dorsiflexion into the landing and still land forefoot, now you've got more knee flexion because of it. And it's like, all of those things go together, right? But that ankle is a huge piece of it. And all that being said, that none of those three joints look the same at a 10 minute mile as they do at a five minute mile. So I think it's just understanding that as you go through the transition and the process, give yourself A, the understanding, and then the education somewhere of how it should look, um, even if it's just visual. But then as you're going through the transition, understand like, okay, I can't go to maximum dynamic range of motion full output every time I do this and, and I shouldn't, and I should have that spectrum. So yeah, I would just like, I can't, I can't overemphasize the name, the, the term spectrum, <laughs> please work the whole range. And I like the running a place exercise that we used to do because it takes the pace 
thing out of the conversation. It's like you can run with optimal um, cadence and a lot of things can line up perfectly. You can land below your center of mass without going anywhere. So zero miles an hour, you're achieving a lot of optimal mechanics, not everything, but a lot of it. And so without pace being in the, you know, in the conversation, you're still doing a lot of it. So I think that that's an unlock for a lot of people. And I think, I think a lot of people at, at the Emil's Adepec story of him training in a rice barrel and then winning the 5k, 10k and, and marathon gold medal, you know, the same Olympics and like training rice, but it's like, because mechanically he's training the right, you know, musculature and sequencing. So yeah, well, you, a lot, you, lot there. You touched on a point that I, I didn't bring up and I'm glad you did is the, the functional range of motion, right? There, there are people that they get it. They know what they're trying to do, but their body won't go there, right? And so, um, what is common, and you know me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go there, is that they're trying to rely on a shoe to try to take the responsibility away from what their body should be doing, and that's yeah. not the way it works. So. Um, I look at people and I say, well, let's look at your functional range of motion off your great toe for starters. Because if, you, if you've got um, um, hallux rigidus, it's called, where you, you, the joint is just locked up and you can't flex this toe, then it's mm. really hard to effectively get on your forefoot, right? Yeah. And then if you do get on your forefoot, but your ankle has a very tight range of motion, then you can't get that whole, that whole um, flexion off of the ankle. So yeah. you're inhibited. So, you know, putting people in a low profile zero drop shoe and they're and they have no range here, you're just gonna you're you're gonna divert that stress to the Achilles and the calf and in some cases yeah. on our fascia. And that, that that's where the injuries are gonna start showing up. So yeah. I, I don't, you know, if I see somebody's really limited there, I won't put him in a, a zero drop shoe. I'll put him yeah. I, try, I try to put him in a four mil. But then you mm. have them go to work on trying to encourage that range. And so there's literally only so much you can do where you're trying to cause the ligaments and tendons to get a little longer. It's not yeah. like you can turn it in. It's not a rubber band. You can't just, you know, give it 50% yeah. more stretch. It's not going to work. But you might get 5%. 5% matters, right? Mm. Uh, but being conscious at least of what your functional ranges are all the way up to your hips, all the way up into your spine. And being conscious of doing things to encourage those ranges so that you have that natural functionality that you're trying to chase, right? Yeah. And I think that that's where a lot of people get dropped. They, drop, they, they really want to do it right, but their body won't take them. Yeah. And, yeah. So, um, and then since you 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 also dropped, we named drop, you said flow, right? Mm -hmm. So <laughs> I told you that I, I'm just wrapping up this book. And it's not out for sale yet. So if somebody's looking for it, don't look for it yet. Give me a couple <laughs> weeks. But this is a couple of weeks. Wow, well, that's exciting. I'm trying to get it out, right? So, nice. so this is basically what we're looking at. And it's interesting because early days, it was all about running. You know, the first book I wrote was exclusively about running, and then came obstacle course racing. And then so I started thinking in terms of that. And that was like the cool new trick. And so trying to intermingle the need for good running mechanics, energy system, obstacles, climbing up and down mountains, things like this, that became the game. Now we have High Rocks, right? And High Rocks is this new hybrid fitness thing that everybody's talking about. Being very, very strong, but very enduring and very capable of, you know, able to leap tall buildings in a single bound, <laughs> uh, faster than a locomotive. You know, it's the whole concept of being big, strong, and fast, right? It's like, who doesn't want to be that, right? Everybody wants to be that. Uh, but um, anyway, this book is a culmination of both those worlds. So a lot of information around the running, uh, a lot of science up front. The peak, you know, I'm, I'm finishing up this final chapter, and I'm talking about the people that went to the table of contests and just wanted to find out where the top looks were and try to just go right to the table. <laughs> glaze yeah. over all the information. That's yeah. like, it's just a little too much for them. Yeah. Um, and then realizing that, oh, God, I'm going to have to go back and read that because otherwise I'm not going to be able to understand this. Yeah. But there's a, the concept of flow is resident in that heavily. 
And yeah. the concept of flow is residing in all of movement patterns. You know, I started thinking you could teach somebody to turn push-ups into a flow exercise. Yeah. Interesting. Think about yeah. it. So you could actually sure. go at a moderate pace and they punch up some quicker paces. And that change uh, in rate of, of movement encourages different facilitation of muscle fibers. Mm. So yeah. it doesn't have to be just about the energy system. It could be how you're developing um, your your musculature, right? Yeah. Uh, and I didn't go that deep into it, but I kind of alluded to the fact that it can, you know, when you're on a rower, when you're on a skier, whenever you you can flow in here, here are some methodologies where you might approach that. Mm. So um, lots of that going on. So there's there's a big there's a big piece on running. That's basically eight weeks of running. I use 10, 10K as just kind of a format, but um, it's not intense. I don't think it tops out over about 25 miles, uh, only because I wanted people that are, you know, trying to just learn this to be able to go in this and be very successful. Where yeah. the marathon program I wrote, if you're a newbie, that might have been a little much for you, yeah. right? Yeah. And so uh, I wanted to be able to to feed that. And then the High Rocks thing, there's, there's, 56 days of high rocks workouts. So basically eight weeks of preparing for a high rocks event in there. And the nice. whole thing on the energy system, the whole thing on heat block training is a big piece in there. I think that's really big. Did you notice, by the way, we were talking about the Olympics. They were showing uh, these athletes who were sticking their hands in those very special cooling gloves. Have you seen that? No, I didn't see oh, that, no. Man, I lit up when I saw that. So they have these mittens where it's like like a, a mitten that's like a block that's on a table. And you slide your hands in there and it cools your hands, which goes down and helps to lower your core temperature. Whoa, that's yeah. amazing. Right, right. It's a cool idea. But it, yeah. the idea is, is that people are starting to get in touch with the fact that, hey, we're going to bring this temperature down. Good. And so I go into all that. And there's a there's a lot of really good stuff in this. It's it's more really cool. than the previous. Uh, it's more information than the previous. And, you know, I told you I'm getting old. I don't know how many more. I didn't think I was going to do this again, and here I did it. Well, thank you for writing it already. I'm uh, looking to, a lot of people are looking forward to picking You'll that up. So, a copy, it'll, it'll come to you. <clears throat> that way you can, you can uh, tell me where I blew it. <laughs> yeah, right. All right. So, cool. any, anything we touched before we, we uh, put a fork in this? No, I think we covered it. I think it's, uh, Take it easy every chance you get. Can't do it all at once. Transition. Ease into it. 